chapter 5. We're continuing our story, our walk through Exodus. We picked this up in the beginning of Mother's Day with Jochebed, and we're going to continue to go to at least Father's Day or a little further. So this morning, I have to uh, I have a question to ask you. How many of you like to plan something? You're, you're an organized person. You have details. You have a plan. You have a system. There's a method to your madness. Okay, uh, Holly and I, we, we have decided to start sharing Google Calendar because there would be times that I would have meetings that I forget to tell her, and then she'd be like, where are you? And I'm in a meeting. So we decided to merge everything together in one calendar. And it helps with communication. It helps her to know where I'm at. It helps me to know where she's at. But what happens is, and I'm thinking of our lives in January. In January, we started planning the summer. We're not, I'm not a big planner, but I've got things i got to get organized. And so we had a plan in January. This week, to, be, to, to give a moment of vulnerability, I'm a little bit jealous of John and Tanya because all, we are supposed to be at Mount Rushmore. We had booked tickets to fly with Holly's parents from here to go out to Mount Rushmore, spend a week out there, do the Badlands, do Mount Rushmore, do Nebraska and uh, Minnesota, uh, North Dakota, that whole, that whole region. We were going to hit five states, and then March hit. And everything that we had planned is no longer planned. I think of our graduates. We're trying to figure out how to do graduation for our high school. Our high school, Nokomis, is trying to figure out how to do graduation. In January, people were starting to send out invitations, and parents were thinking, how am I going to pay for all these people to feed them? Now parents are saying, how do I get all these people together, and how do I honor my graduate? College graduates, they're sitting walking into their last semester going, hey, it's my last semester. I'm going to get this job. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have this wedding. It's going to be awesome. And then March hits. And some of you are feeling that tension. Some of you are feeling that angst that there's plan A, but plan A hasn't quite happened the way that we think it was. So some of us are on plan B, plan C, plan D. Some of you are plan AA because you just can't quite figure out. You've tried 25 other plans. As we walk into Exodus chapter 5 this morning, the Israelites have a plan but it's not working out the way that they think it is. And it's really, this really fits in well with what we are going through in June of 2020. Who would have thought that in March we would be approaching Father's Day with the same kind of restrictions that we had? This is not the way we planned it. But how do we change now that we know the plan? And what can we do to honor God? All right, we have Exodus chapter 5. I'm going to cover 20 verses this morning. I have it broken down in a couple of different sections. God has a plan. So if you want to get your Bibles and keep them open, I'm going to be going back and forth through Exodus chapter 5. The first one is God has a plan, or there is a plan that God wants to do. So afterwards, all right, that afterwards is another way of saying therefore. And when we come to the word therefore, we should ask the question, what's the therefore therefore? It helps us to come in context. So afterwards, that's going to take us back to chapter 4. What happens in chapter 4, the previous verses? Well, Israel has just heard from Moses, who is the prince of Egypt that has been in exile for 40 years, that they are going to have freedom. Aaron, his brother, is there saying, this is Moses. This is the one that's going to be God's mouthpiece. So the two of them together, they tell Israel this. What's Israel's response from last week? They come and they worship. They have opportunity to praise the Lord because after 430 years, they're going to receive the freedom. Their response to that revelation is worship. All right, so they have this worship time. They have this time of praising the Lord. They have this time of glorying in their freedom. They've got the plan going, I'm going to pack my bag because this is now the plan. We're good to go. We've got the plan. It all is going to work out. They have the plan. Let's see if it works. Afterwards, after all that, Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh. Who is Pharaoh? Pharaoh is viewed as a god, little g. And nobody tells Pharaoh what to do. Pharaoh tells people what to do. 
So here come Moses and Aaron coming in with a word from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Nobody goes in and tells Pharaoh what to do, except the God of Pharaoh, which is God, Israel's God. The great I am from a couple, from a couple weeks ago. So thus says the Lord God of Israel. They're coming in with authority. They're not coming in going, hey, we sort of think that you might want to decide if you might want to let us go. They're coming in saying, here comes the word from the God, the God that made everything, the great I am, and he says, let my people go. This is what God desires, that they may hold a feast. God wants his people free from Egypt to be able to go out into the wilderness to worship him in spirit and in truth. He wants them free to go into the wilderness to be able to hold this feast. That is what God's plan is. First question of application is, am I accomplishing God's will for my life? Think back. Go back in this afternoon. I want you to look at Exodus chapter 2, Exodus chapter 3, and Exodus chapter 4. Was Moses really willing to follow the Lord's commands? I would, I would say he sort of was, but he also wasn't. He heard what God told him to do, but he had excuse after excuse after excuse. Remember, I'm not good in speech, so God gave him Aaron. I don't think they'll believe me, so God gave him the three signs. He had all of these excuses and now we see Moses and Aaron are finally walking into the court of Pharaoh and are saying, here's what God says. How about you? Are you accomplishing what God's will is for your life? Are you living in obedience? What God has told you to do. It's very simple for us to sit here on a Sunday morning at 1110 and go, yep, it's good. I can do this for 45 minutes to an hour. But it's often difficult to live in obedience when we're outside and no one else is watching. So the first question I have for you is, are you accomplishing God's will? Am I accomplishing God's will for my life? Am I living in obedience to what God has called me to do? Now Pharaoh is going to have a response. And Pharaoh's response is going to first, we're going to focus on his heart. And then we're going to focus on his hands. So as a Teacher, as a pastor, I want to speak to three parts of you. You know the three parts I speak to. I speak to your head. I want you to gain knowledge. I want you to understand. I want you to grow in your actual factual knowledge of God's word. But I also want to speak to your heart. Because when I get to your heart and you are stirred with emotion, then your heart begins to soften. And then what happens in the second part of this is that I see the change in your hands. And so we're going to look at Pharaoh's heart and what he's going to do and how he's going to respond to God's plan. Moses and Aaron walk in and say, Pharaoh, God wants his people free. Moses has, uh, I'm sorry, Pharaoh has a decision to make. Do I live in obedience to what God says or do I live in disobedience to what God says? And it's going to be an example for us to follow. So here comes Pharaoh's heart response. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? I want to look at this from a couple different angles, all within the same passage. I want you to look at and understand it from Pharaoh's point of view. I want you to understand it from God's point of view. And then I want you to be able to look at it from Moses' point of view, because Moses is going to be telling Pharaoh about the God of Israel. And I'm going to push, and I'm going to say, we can learn and be encouraged by Moses' act of obedience to telling, to telling Pharaoh about the Lord, and we're going to see that, Pharaoh, that Moses is actually evangelizing or sharing his faith. And we're going to see how Pharaoh responds to that. So Pharaoh says, who's the Lord? This is not, for Pharaoh's point of view, Pharaoh is not sitting here saying, I don't know who God is. Who is this that the Lord says? This is not a statement of ignorance. This is a statement of just pure rebellion, of cockiness, of egoness. So when you share your faith, when you go up to someone and say, can I talk to you about Jesus? Some people say, I don't know who Jesus is. Some people do not understand the person and the work of Christ. I would say they don't understand the gospel. They don't understand the death, the, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. They only understand the name of Jesus as a curse word. 
That is not where Pharaoh is at. Pharaoh knows who the Lord is. Pharaoh is just egotistical enough to say, who is this God? Who is, who is the Lord? Now, look at it from Moses' point of view. Moses comes in and says, I've got a word from the Lord. I've got something I need to tell you. I have to tell you. I've been set on commission to tell you. And look at it from Moses' point of view. He, he wants to share with Pharaoh who God is. And Pharaoh turns to Moses and just shuts him down. Have you ever tried to share your faith? And someone looks at you and says, get lost. Or someone looks at you and says, who is God? And they don't care. You see how this has so many different layers of application. So Pharaoh turns and says, who's the Lord? If I can put a Thomism in here, what he's really saying is, I don't care who it is. I'm Pharaoh. I'm the man. You can't come to me and tell me. Thus says somebody, I am the God, little g. All that within four words. So he says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? So now we see what happens. We see that, Mo that Moses has told Pharaoh what happens. Now we're going to see the example from Pharaoh for somebody that's going to live in disobedience to what the Lord has said. And we're going to be able to watch this. Israel's going to watch Pharaoh harden his heart. Egypt is going to watch Pharaoh harden his heart. You and I, 5,000 years later, get to see what happens to someone that hardens their heart towards the Lord. So Pharaoh says, who, who is God? Who is this guy that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. He has no knowledge. He has knowledge of the Lord. He has an intellectual knowledge but he doesn't have a heart change knowledge of the Lord. And he doesn't care to obey God. Do you know anybody that is like this? And our hearts break because they are just living in a hard-heartedness towards the Lord and towards the commands of the Lord. And I would say Moses is coming, but with the command of God, we go sharing the gospel of Jesus. And when we share, we see people and they shut down. They just don't care. God has to say. So Pharaoh says, who's the Lord? I don't care. I don't know the Lord that I should let people go. We see Pharaoh's heart is hearted. If you want to remember from last week, I found this really cool graph in one of my study Bibles, and it's the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Remember last week we talked about how Pharaoh's heart was hardened? But God didn't harden his heart. Pharaoh first hardened his heart, and then God waited to see Pharaoh's response. Remember I talked about the 20 different references? I found this cool graph I wanted to, to show you. If you want that, let me know. I'll send it to you or I can copy it for you. But this is all the references about Pharaoh's heart being hardened, God hardening Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh hardening Pharaoh's heart. The 20 references we talked about. We see here, here Pharaoh's heart is hardening towards the Lord. It's becoming stubborn towards the Lord. It's not wanting to follow the Lord. One study Bible I read, it's a New Living Translation, it says, what Pharaoh's really asking is, is there someone or something greater than my self-interest? And we really get down to the heart of the issue here, is Pharaoh is seeking his own self. Pharaoh is looking out for what is best for Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is asking, I am my own God. I am my own self, and it's all about me. Me, myself, and I. Do we hear that today? And we see and we hear that lack of us coming under submission to God and serving someone else other than ourselves. What a great quote. I love this one. It's someone or something greater than my self-interest. So we see Pharaoh's heart in verse 3. So they, being Moses and Aaron, said to Pharaoh, the God of the Hebrews, so they are telling Pharaoh, this is what happened. This is the God. This is the great I am from last week. He has met with us. What are Moses and Aaron doing? They are sharing what God has done in their life. They are sharing how the Lord has spoken with them. They are sharing how God has changed their life. They're witnessing. 
Look at it from this point of view. They're witnessing. They're telling Pharaoh, Pharaoh, you've got to know what the God of the Hebrew says, the great I am says. This is what he did. This is our experience. This is how my life was changed. I once was lost. I am now found. I once was blind, but now I see. He met with me. And my life has never been the same. You can see how Pharaoh is sharing his faith in, the 20, in 2020. He says, please, let us go three days journey into the desert. We've looked at that in Exodus chapter 18. Israel wants to go out to the wilderness to worship the Lord so they can sacrifice to the Lord our God. Why do they need to go to the wilderness? Because the animals that they would need to sacrifice, the Egyptians view them as little gods. And so if the, Israel, if the Israelites are going to sacrifice an animal, that's going to cause a lot of controversy in Egypt because the Egyptians worship that, and it's going to be a lot of trouble for the Israelites. They're not going to be able to worship the Lord the way that the Lord commands. So he says, let us go into the wilderness three days journey to sacrifice to the Lord. Because if we don't, the Lord may fall on us with pestilence or the sword. God may punish us if we don't live in obedience to what he has called us to do. I wonder what Moses is reminded of here. Remember last week with Zipporah, where Moses was on his deathbed and the Lord was judging him because Moses was not living in obedience? You think Moses spoke with a little bit more urgency, a little bit more quickness in his step going, listen, it's really important that we obey God, because if we don't obey God, he's going to come and he could bring judgment to us. I wonder if there's like a, a part three of the verse, of verse three, and Moses could go in and give testimony, saying, I disobey God, and this is what he did. God is serious about his obedience. Then the king of Pharaoh said to them, being Moses and Aaron, Moses and Aaron, why did you take the people from their work and get back to your labor? Hold on, don't miss that. Did you miss what happened? Go back to chapter 4. They had this worship session. They had this worship experience. They worshiped the Lord because they were going to be free. Israel has this plan. My plan A, Moses walks in. He's going to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh's going to be absolutely not a problem. Thanks for all your work. Let us help you get out. So Israel's coming here with their bags packed. And what do they do? They come and they've stopped working. They have ceased from all their labor of making bricks because they have a plan. They walked up and said, this is the plan that God's going to do. And Moses and Aaron have walked into Pharaoh and Pharaoh said, who is God? I don't care who God is. Get your people back to work. Who gave them the right to stop working? So you see there's a, a different plan here of execution from what they think. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now. So there are about 2 million people, 2 million Israelites. That's about the size of Houston in Texas. 2 million people live in Houston, give or take. There are about 2 million people, give or take, in Israel. Now, out of those 2 million people, most commentators think that there's a million people that are part of Pharaoh's workforce. That's the size of Dallas, Texas. That's a lot of work that can be done. And now all those million people have just quit work. They just stopped. And Pharaoh says, look, the people are many. There's two million people. If two million people start to rebel, we've got problems. We've got bigger problems because my workforce of a million people have stopped. And you make them rest from their labor. Moses, what gives you the right? This is not how it's supposed to work out. So you have Pharaoh's plan. And now you have Israel's plan. And unfortunately, they don't come together and they're not the same plan. And then you have a third person's plan, which is the Lord's plan. And his plan is not Pharaoh's plan, and Pharaoh's plan is not Israel's plan. You feel the, the, the tension here this morning? Because we all have a plan. It's great when it's the Lord's plan. But when it's not the Lord's plan, then we kind of figure it out. So the question of application I have is, am I tender in following the Lord's commands? God has told Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh looked at him and said, no. Clear, clear, crystal clear what is required of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, I don't really care. I really don't want to listen to your God. 
Who is your God? And then we go out and we share our faith. The people say, I don't care. I want to do what I want to do. I want to serve my interests. I don't want to come under submission of God. And then you sit here this morning, and I stand here this morning, and I ask myself the question, am I tender in following God's commands? Am I living in obedience to what God has told me? God has made his word clear in his book. It's very simple to read, and yet it's so difficult to do. And so we see Pharaoh, his heart is hardened because he's not tender in following what God has called him to do. How about you? Are you tender and following in the obedience of what God has commanded? If not, why not? So we have here that Pharaoh's heart responds in 2 through 5. But then Pharaoh's hands are going to follow his heart. Now, if if you would look at this, when you change a person's heart, you change a person's hands. Sometimes we always focus on a person's hands. Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. But if we can push in and say, why are you doing that? We speak more to the heart. Follow this. Pharaoh has heard what God wants. Pharaoh's heart has been hard, has been turned stubborn, the King James says, towards, his, towards God. And because his heart is hardened or stubborn, his hands are are going to follow his heart. And Pharaoh's going to have actions that are going to follow his heart, which is why it's so important to make sure your heart is leading your hands. Let's look at this. So the same day, what's the same day? The same day Moses and Aaron go in and say, Pharaoh, God said let his people go. He wants them to go worship. That very same day, was it morning, was it afternoon, evening, whatever time it was, the same day after this interaction... Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people, their officers. Remember, he's got a million people, so he's got, if you will, managers over pods of people. And each taskmaster has a group of people, and they need to make a certain quota of bricks. So he commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as before. I went and I found some Google images for bricks that were made in Egypt. They would have mud and they would have clay and they would make water and they would make it into a mud pie. But the straw that was put in here would be the binder or the filler to keep the bricks together in the form. Because if you don't have the straw to keep the bricks together, they're nothing but mud pies. And if you've ever gone out and played in the mud, has anybody gone out and played in mud? I have. It's good fun. It's very therapeutic. You go out and play in the mud and you make this wonderful pie, stick a dandelion in it, and then guess what happens the next day? You go and you pick it up and what? It crumbles because it dries out. The same thing would happen in Egypt if you didn't have the straw because the straw would pack in the brick to hold it together. So no straw, you might as well go back out and make mud pies. This is a picture of some some drawings that they found on ancient Egypt walls of how they made brick. So Pharaoh says, hey, you need to keep making brick, but guess what? I'm not going to make it as easy for you. So you see, Pharaoh's heart is hardened towards God. He's going to show that in his hands. And he says, you're not going to have any straw to make bricks as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. So it's a natural reading of the text is that the Egyptians would bring the straw to the Israelites to the mud pits, and they would have a form, and they would make the brick with the straw that was delivered. That's no longer going to happen. Israel's going to have to go get the straw, and then bring it back themselves, and then get into the mud pits to make the same amount of bricks as before. You shall no longer lay on them, I'm sorry, and you shall lay on them, or you will lay on them, the same quota of bricks which they made before. So not only do they have to make the same number of bricks, they have to make the same number of bricks, but do more labor to get the same amount. They have to go get the straw. You shall not reduce it. Why would Pharaoh do this? Why is Pharaoh reacting in this way? Well, it says here, they are idle. The Israelites are idle. They have too much time on their hands. 
And because they have too much time on their hands, they can cry out saying, let us go and sacrifice to God. Really what Pharaoh is saying here, and don't misunderstand me, is idle hands are a devil's play yard. What he's saying is, you all got too much time on your hands, so you must not be busy enough, so I'm going to get you extra busy so that you don't have time to think about going to sacrifice to your God. Is what he's saying. And you see how Pharaoh's hands are following his hardness of heart. Can you, do you see that with me this morning? My dad, he had a philosophy, and I was not in the use of home at all. But my dad said, I have a philosophy for you, young Tom. He says, I'm going to make you work. And you're going to be so tired at the end of the day during the summer that you're going to be too tired to think about getting into trouble. And so this is what Pharaoh is trying to do. He's saying to Israel, you're going to be so tired. Now, I'm not calling my dad Pharaoh, so don't misapply that, okay? <laughs> so he's saying, I'm going to get you so tired, and you're going to be so busy that you're not going to be able to think about going into sacrifice and going to worship the Lord in the wilderness. So you see, Pharaoh's heart has become even harder, and now his hands are following his heart. Let more work be laid on the men. So we're going to make them work even more. That they may labor in it and let them not regard the false words. This is silly talk. Pharaoh's saying, I don't want to listen to this. I'm God. Verse 10. And the taskmasters of the people and their officers went out and spoke to the people, saying, thus says to Pharaoh, hold on, Bible scholars. What happened in verse 1? Look at verse 1. How did Moses start out the conversation? Thus says the God of the Hebrews, or thus says the Lord. Thus says Yahweh. So here comes Pharaoh in verse 10, and what's Pharaoh saying in verse 10? Thus says Pharaoh. Thus says God, little g. Don't miss that. Pharaoh has heard from the Lord. His heart has hardened. His hands are falling his heart. And he's saying now, now we're going to see who God is. Thus says Pharaoh. You see the contrast that happens? And you see the Israelites looking at this going, we got a guy in utter rebellion. We got a guy that's not following the Lord. What's going to happen? So Pharaoh's come out. He's giving his own orders. He's giving his own edicts. I will not give you straw. Go get it yourself. Go get yourself straw where you can find it. And yet none of your work will be reduced. So the taskmasters are now telling the people. So the people, the Israelites, were scattered. Well, if you're going to stop a rebellion, just scatter the people. So families are split apart because they have to go through the land to find the straw that's no longer being delivered to them. So families are broken apart. Children are, are separated from their spouses or from their parents. Families, dads are separated from their parents or from their, their children. Why? Because they have to go find the straw. Hey, this isn't the way it was supposed to work out. This was supposed to be the Israelites walk in, and they go, hey, Pharaoh, let us go. And they, remember, they stopped working, they got their bags packed, and they're ready to go due west. Go right out, or due east. Right out, of the, right out of Egypt, right into the wilderness. This is not how it was supposed to be. Can we all agree that this is not how 2020, summer of 2020, mm -hmm. is supposed to be? And we can really understand, we can lean in going, this is not the way I planned it. And so you're supposed to go scatter. So instead of going out to worship the Lord, you're going out to get straw, to come back to get back into the same mud pits and make the bricks. And you can't even find the straw now. You've got to find the stubble. Life is not going really well for the Israelites. And the taskmasters forced them to hurry, saying, so they're going to talk to them, fill your work, your daily quota, as when there were straw. So there's got some verbal communication going. I would push and say verbal abuse. I think that this translation is really nice. I think that we can lean into this and go, there's a lot of verbal abuse happening from the Egyptians to the Israelites. <clears throat> and it only escalates more. Not only are they being verbally abused, look at what happens down here. The Egyptians are now beating them. Now they're having physical abuse. Not only did they hear it verbally, now they're hearing it physically. What does Israel think they're doing? They're getting ready to leave, and now they are getting verbally abused, physically beaten, their families are separated and scattered, and the workload has just increased more with the production being the same. This is not how Israel planned it. They were beaten. 
And they were asked, or they were taught to say, why have you not fulfilled your task of making bricks, both yesterday and today, as before? So Israel's facing a lot of adversity. I have a question of application. I want to come at it from a different point of view. A am I making life easier or more difficult for people? I look out and some of you are still in the workforce. Some of you still have leadership opportunities in the church, in the community. And you have an opportunity to take a difficult situation and make it easier. Pharaoh, he hears what God says. Let my people go. Israel wants to go and they want to worship. Pharaoh is only interested in himself and now he wants to make life miserable for the Israelites. And so he has taken and made the situation even more difficult. During these times, are we as believers making situations more difficult for people or easier for people? We have a great opportunity to help people and lead people into an a better way to show them the gospel. But we can only do that if we are doing it and making life easier. Pharaoh's heart is hardened. Pharaoh's hands are following his heart. How about you? So we see here you're tracking. God has a plan. Pharaoh's heart has not been touched. It's been hardened. Because his heart has been hardened, his hands are going to be hardened. And now Israel has to figure out this is not the way it's supposed to be. So Israel is going to have a change of attitude. What was Israel doing in chapter 4? Then to chapter 4? They were worshiping. They were praising God, saying, we're getting ready, we're packing our bags, we're going to go, we're going to leave. And then Israel is going to have to change their attitude, or their attitude has been changed. Then the officers of the children of Israel, they came and they cried out to Pharaoh. They approached Pharaoh, the same officers and elders that met with Moses. In chapter 4, the end of chapter 4. And they said to Pharaoh, why are you dealing with thus with your servants? Hold on. Who is Israel? They're God's chosen people. God chose them. God called them his first and eldest son. So now Israel is going to Pharaoh saying, um, Pharaoh, we're your people. You see, Israel has a identity crisis. What changed? What changed from the end of chapter 4 to the middle of chapter 5? Adversity and struggles and hardship. And I'm not, I don't understand all that Israel is going through. And I don't pretend to know what all of Israel is going through. But I do know that in times of difficulty and in times of crisis, we begin to look to ourselves and we forget to look to the God that is in control. And Israel was worshiping the Lord, <clears throat> and now they have taken that worship, and they're saying, Pharaoh, we're all yours. We're no longer God's people. We're your servants. Notice that change, how quickly it happened. There's no straw to be given to your servants, and they send us <clears throat> make bricks. And indeed, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your people. So Israel's coming and complaining, saying, Pharaoh, we're your servants. Why are you doing this? Then he, being Pharaoh, said, you are idle. You're not busy enough. You're lazy, is really what he's saying. You are idle. You are idle. You're lazy. You're lazy. Therefore, because you don't have enough work to do, you say, let us go and sacrifice the Lord. I'm going to give you more work to do so that you don't forget and so that you're not so bored. Therefore, go now and work. Go back to work. For no straw shall be given to you, yet you shall deliver the quota of the bricks. So more work, same production level, get it done. And the officers and the children of Israel, they saw that they were in trouble after it was said, you shall not reduce the bricks. Hey, they walked in thinking Pharaoh's going to be able to have this change of heart, and he's going to understand, and we're going to be able to get things back to the way things were. They walked out of there, and hope deferred makes the heart faint. They walked out going, this is not going to get any better. And their attitude changed because they had a struggle. Because I would say to you this morning, they had a plan. I got my bags packed and I'm ready to go into the wilderness. But God told Moses back in Exodus 3 and Exodus 4, Pharaoh's going to reject me and we're going to have to make life miserable. So Israel's plan did not match up with God's plan. And we see that they're not coming together. And Israel is losing confidence 
And they're taking their focus off of God and they're putting it onto their circumstances, forgetting who is in control. So they left saying, we're in trouble. This is not going to be good. You are not going to reduce any of the bricks from your daily quota. Then they came out from Pharaoh and they met Moses and Aaron. So these elders walked in, these officers of Israel walked in. Moses and Aaron are not with them. So Moses and Aaron went in, verse 1, thus says God, let my people go. They leave, bad things happen, the quota increases, the straw stops, the, the officers go back in. Moses and Aaron are standing outside going, what's going to happen? So they're not even part of this conversation. It's the leadership of Israel who stood there to meet them. And they said to them, the, the elders, the leaders of Israel, said to Moses and Aaron, let the Lord look on you and judge. Look how quickly they turned on Moses. Boom! They turned on Moses. What happened in the chapter 4? They were worshiping. They were saying, Moses and Aaron, you're leading us out of the promise, to the promised land. We're out of Egypt. We're out of slavery. This is awesome. We're good to go. They're coming out 20 verses later. God judge you, Aaron. God judge you. Because now we have been abhorrent. Different translation. We stink in the sight of Pharaoh. We smell bad in the sight of Pharaoh. Because we have went and rocked the boat. Because our plan did not match Pharaoh's plan, and Pharaoh's plan did not match God's plan. And because of that, now we have adversity, and Israel has stopped looking at the Lord, and they're only looking to themselves, and they have forgotten God's plan. They have forgotten that God is in control. And so they said, we have stink, we now stink in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants and the taskmasters. And we've given them opportunity to, for them to beat us even more. So the question I have for you this morning is, how do I respond in difficult times? Israel's in a difficult time. They have a plan. What's their plan? I've talked about it three or four times. They want to get out of Egypt. They want to go worship the Lord. They have this plan. Suitcases are in their hand. The U-Haul's ready to go, and they're going. Except one person's in their way, Pharaoh. And they have these difficult times. And you can't control how I respond in difficult times. I can't control how you respond in difficult times. I can only control how I respond. And sometimes what happens, friends, is we lose sight of God and we start to focus more on our problems, forgetting that God is sovereign and knowing what is going on. Sometimes it's a beautiful picture when I have a plan and God has a plan and they come together. Isn't that beautiful? That encourages me. It's discouraging when I have a plan and God has a plan and they go in opposite directions. And right now, Israel is not walking and following what, and, and let me put it a different way. Israel is not having a plan that they think God is following. And God has a different plan. So let's have one final application before we close our time. My final one for this whole section is, am I patiently waiting for God's plan to occur? We have to wait for God's plan to occur. His times are not my times. His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. And I'm not a patient person. I'm 38 years old. If Google takes more than 0.3 seconds to figure out a search response, I go to something else. I'm not a patient person. Some of you have the patience of Job. And I want you to teach me. I just don't have the patience to wait, to learn. But some of you are very, very patient. And some of you, are not patient at all. Israel has a goal, but they're not really waiting patiently. And they're starting to focus more on their circumstances than focus on the God of heaven. There are five questions I've talked about, five applications. Am I accomplishing God's will for my life? Is my heart tender to following the Lord's commands? Am I making life easier or more difficult for people who are following my leadership? How do I respond to difficult times? And am I patiently waiting for God's plan to occur? Five application questions. Five ways we can walk out of here applying God's word through the story and the narrative of Moses. Let's close our time in a word of prayer this morning. One thing I love to do with your pastor is pray for you.
with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Is there anyone this morning that says, just stick your hand up and say, Tom, would you pray for me? Because I'm not sure I'm accomplishing what God has called me to do. Would you pray for me? I see that hand. Thank you. Anybody else? So anybody here this morning says, Tom, would you pray for me? Because I'm not really living in obedience to what God has called me to do. I need to be more tender. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody here this morning that says, would you pray for me, Tom? Because I'm in a leadership position, and I want to make life easier for those that are following me, not more difficult. Would you pray for opportunities for me to lead? Is there anybody here this morning that would pray, ask me to pray for them and say, would you pray for me? Because I'm in a difficult situation, and I want to respond well. Would you pray that I can respond in a godly way? Is there anyone here this morning that says, Tom, would you pray for me? Because I need to patiently wait for God's plan. And I'm not a patient person. Would you pray? I see those two hands. Thank you. Lord, we're so thankful for this morning. It's a great biblical narrative of Moses. And we can see so many real life applications in 2020 for how your word continues to minister to us. I pray that we would be a people that would live in obedience to what you have called Lord, help us to be able to know what you have called us to and then live in obedience to what you have called us to. Help us to be tender. I think of those that have slipped their hand up. Lord, they they have been struck this morning by a desire to live in accordance to your word, by living in obedience to you that their hearts would follow and be tender, unlike we saw with Pharaoh this morning. I pray for those that are in leadership positions that their lives would be opportunities to make things easier, not more difficult. I pray for those that are going through hard times. Lord, that we would respond to bring glory to you and honor to you. And Lord, that we would be able to focus on you and not always focus on our current situation. And God, I pray that we would patiently wait for you. Lord, we know that you're in control and we have a plan and we know that you have a plan. Lord, I pray that our plan would become your plan, that we would patiently wait for your perfect will to be done. Lord, we know it's easy to say and it's hard to do. So Lord, may you be honored and glorified in all that is said and done. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Thanks for coming out. And this morning, we do not have a closing hymn. Christine needed to leave. So I thank you for coming out to church, and I trust that you will have a great afternoon. Stay safe and sanitized. I'll see you next week. Have a great week. Can I get that for me? Thank you. It's like 15 it's like a 15 second lag